Welcome and thank you very much for joining the Blazor WebAssembly Full Stack Bootcamp. After the next couple of hours you will have what it takes to build a modern web application from start to finish with Blazor WebAssembly, Web API and Entity Framework so that you can really call yourself a full stack Blazor and .NET developer. We will start with the client application where we utilize Blazor WebAssembly. You will learn how data binding and event handling works with Blazor, what Razor components are and how they communicate. There are several ways of communication between components like parameters, events and services. You will see how to implement them all. Additionally, we will build forms with all the controls Blazor WebAssembly provides like input text fields, checkboxes, select fields, radio buttons and so on. And we will also see how validation in these forms works. Authentication is also very important of course. So we will implement a custom authentication state provider and use the authorized view component to control access of authorized and unauthorized users. Don't worry, you will learn what all these things are along the way in this course. To authorize a user, we will use JSON web tokens and actually create that token later with a web service. We will call this service using an instance of the HTTP client class. As already mentioned, we will also build the backend of this application with a web API and entity framework. The web API provides all the controllers. These are the web service in essence, which is called from the Blazor WebAssembly client application. Entity Framework is used to create a SQL Server database with all the necessary tables using code-first migration. So all your data will be stored persistently. But the backend will be covered later in this course. We will focus on the client first. So let's move on with some preparations and then start building the application. The only tools you need in the beginning are the .NET SDK and Visual Studio. Now, depending on when you're watching this course, you can choose to download the .NET 5 SDK or the preview or release candidate of .NET 6 or .NET 6 has already been released, then you're safe to choose this SDK. This course will use .NET 5, because by the time of recording these lectures, this version has been the latest stable release. So to be absolutely safe, please choose this version as well. But there shouldn't be many differences between .NET 5 and .NET 6, if any. So please download the .NET SDK for your operating system. Regarding Visual Studio, you can use the Community Edition of Visual Studio 2019. It is totally free and it provides all the functions we need. If you decide to use a preview version of a .NET SDK, you probably also need a preview of Visual Studio though. Just keep that in mind. Otherwise, the latest released version of Visual Studio is perfect. If you already want to get the necessary tools for the backend, you can download and install Postman. You just have to scroll way down and then you find the link download app. We will use Postman to test our web service calls later on. Sometimes it's just nice to test a call to the web API before you build the corresponding front end. Additionally, you could already download the SQL Server Express and the SQL Server Management Studio, which enables you to have a look at the SQL Server database. But again, these tools are used later in this course. For now, please download and install the .NET SDK of your choice and Visual Studio 2019 Community Edition. One last thing before we start with creating our Blazor WebAssembly project, you can get the complete code you'll see during this course on GitHub and here is the link to the repository. 
As you can see in the commits, these commits match the structure of this lecture. Some commits are done after a single lecture and some are packed with a bit more code. So if you're struggling with your code, please have a look at this repository. I hope it helps to find a solution or just grab the code and build your own browser game with it, whatever you like. Anyways, if you still have any problems with the code, you can also reach out to me, of course. And now let's create the project. All right, so when you start Visual Studio, choose create a new project first. And then from the templates, we choose Blazor WebAssembly app. If you don't find it, of course, you can enter it here in the search bar filter by Blazor and then we choose Blazor WebAssembly app. And if you don't know the difference between a Blazor server app and a Blazor WebAssembly app, just real quick, a Blazor server app runs completely on the server. There are no actual web service calls like you might be used to with a typical web application. The description also says that user interactions are handled over a signal R connection, meaning over WebSockets. So the user doesn't really download the client app to the browser, which is great, but the big disadvantage is that the server has to handle everything. So if your app has a lot of users, for instance, the server has to manage all the interactions of every user, all current states, and so on. Now with a Blazor WebAssembly application, the server has a lot less to do because the client handles the interactions, which might be faster for the user, speaking of user experience and offline functionality, for instance, and which is the typical structure of a modern web application. Maybe you already built a web application with a .NET backend and a JavaScript framework like Angular, React or Vue.js for the frontend. These frameworks handle user interactions as well and make web service calls to the backend. With Blazor WebAssembly, it is the same thing, but you don't have to write JavaScript. You can keep writing C-sharp code and even use the same classes for the client and the server. I just love that fact. Okay, so long story short, we choose Blazor WebAssembly app and click next. And then let's give this thing a suitable name like Blazor Battles, for instance. And then we click Next again. And then we choose the framework. As you can see here, the current framework here is now .NET 5. Before it was .NET Core 3.1, but we want to use .NET 5 here. And then configure for HTTPS is correct. We don't need authentication for now. We will do this by ourselves with JSON web tokens. And then we also say ASP.NET Core hosted. It's important to check this box here because this provides a solution where we can already make use of a web API. So a full stack web application in one solution with C Sharp and .NET only. And that's it. Let's click create. And there is our new solution. Perfect. Let's have a look at the solution explorer on the right and then see what has been created for us in the next lecture. So in the solution explorer of Visual Studio, you see three projects. We've got the client project, server, and also the shared project. Now the client project represents the front end. Here's where all the Blazor WebAssembly magic will happen. The server project will be the home of the web API and entity framework and the shared project will be used to share classes between the client and server projects. This means building a model once and using it for both the client and the server. You can already see the weather forecast model here for instance, but we'll talk about the example application in the next lecture. Let's have a look at the client project first. The program CS file with the main function here is the starting point. We will mainly use this method to register new services we write by ourselves or services that will be added by new packages. You can already see that something is happening here with the HTTP client class and above that line a root component is added 
which would be the app component we can find in the app razor file. A component in Blazor is a razor file. That's why it's also called a razor component. So the app component is the root component where you actually see the use of further components like the router, for instance, the found and the not found components and the route view, for instance. Now the router component that wraps the other ones in this case decides if a route that has been entered in the address bar of the browser is correct or not. If it is correct, the found component will be used to display the content of the entered route. If not, the not found component will be used. Both components in turn use further components, a route view and a layout view. And these two make use of the main layout. But let's stick to the layout view first. It uses the main layout, but the content can already be seen here. It's simply text wrapped by a standard HTML paragraph tag. The route view though uses the main layout, but with the content of the actual page the user wants to see by entering a particular route. And this page can be found in the pages folder. We'll get to that in a second. Let's have a quick look at the imports razor file. It's quite simple. You will find global using directives here and that's it. If you don't want to add a reference in a single component or use the complete namespace, then simply add it here instead. Okay, next let's have a look at the main layout in the shared folder. Looks like standard HTML at first glance, right? Well, the only difference is that it inherits from the layout component base class. And when you have a look at this class, you can see that it has a property called body. The type of this property is render fragment, which is used in the main layout with add body. Let me have a look again. Here, there's the add body and that's where the pages will be rendered. Additionally, you can see another used component, the nav menu up here, but we'll get to that soon. Now, do you already see how these things work together? A component can be used by adding a tag with its exact name and any page will be rendered in the add body part of a layout. You could build a custom layout if you like and use that one instead of the main layout in the app razor component. That's totally up to you. You would simply use this new layout here instead of the main layout, for instance. Anyways, let's have a look at the pages, for instance, the index razor. The crucial part is the add page directive on top with a string, which already is the route for that page. You don't have to specify that route anywhere else. There's not another file where you have to enter every single route. You just put it up here in a single page. So just create a component, add that add page directive and you're done. It's the same with the fetch data and the counter pages. You can see here at page fetch data, this is the route and here the same for the counter. But before we have a deeper look at the code, a quick word about the other projects. The server project consists of a program CS and a startup CS file. And in the startup CS, we can find the configure services and the configure methods. The configure services method configures the apps services, meaning a reusable component that provides app functionality. We will register services in the future in this method so they can be consumed in our web service via dependency injection, for instance, similar to the program CS of the client project. Now, please don't mind all these buzzwords right now. We will get to them throughout this course. Now, the configure method creates the server apps request processing pipeline meaning the method is used to specify how the app responds to HTTP requests. As you can see, we're using HTTPS redirection, routing, and so on. With all these use extension methods, so use and then anything else, we are adding middleware components to the request pipeline. For instance, use HTTPS redirection adds middleware for redirecting HTTP requests to HTTPS. 
Now the startup class is specified when the app's host is built and we can see that in the program CS class in the create host builder method. Here the startup class is specified by calling use startup. Regarding the app settings, Jason, we only need to know that we can add and modify some configurations here. More interesting and often used throughout the backend part of this course is the controllers folder. The first controller you see here is the generated weather forecast controller, the demo controller if you want. We'll get to the details of controllers later, but for now it's only important to know that we can already call this get method down here. And I would say we do exactly that next. Let's run the application first and then talk about some files we haven't talked about yet. The great thing about Visual Studio and a .NET Core hosted Blazor WebAssembly application is that you can simply start this whole package with that little play button on top. Let's do exactly that. We click that button. The actual starting project is the server project and Visual Studio will fire up IIS Express with a browser of your choice to start the app. If you get an SSL warning, just accept the self-signed certificate and you're good to go. When you have a close look, you see the text loading. Let me refresh this page. You have seen loading there. Now you might ask, where does this come from? Well, the client project has got a folder called www root. Let's have a quick look again at the solution explorer. And this folder here is the root of the actual website. And here next to some cascading style sheets and the fav icon, you can find the index HTML. And here you can see the actual loading text. Now any resources you want to add, like icons, images, and so on, have to be added to this www root folder. Style sheets, however, can also be added next to the corresponding component, but we will get to that later. The crazy thing now is that you can actually debug the client and the server at the same time. Back to Chrome and let's have a look at the counter page. Now you can see when I click the button here, the counter simply increases. And now let's have a look at the code. So back to Visual Studio, we open the counter razor file. And in here, it seems like there's not much to see, but actually there's already happening a lot. You already know the page directive here on top, and then you can see the current count variable, for instance, and this integer variable can also be found in the add code block here, this variable. So in this add code block, you're free to write C sharp code and use that code above within your HTML codes. With the current code variable, you already see how data binding is done in Blazor WebAssembly. And in the button, you can already see event handling. The onclick event marked with an add calls the increment count method simple as that. If you don't like having your c -sharp code together with HTML, you can create a code behind file for your c -sharp code instead. Let's do that real quick. We stop the application and then we create a new class. So here, right click, new class, and we call this file counter razor cs. The name is important because then Visual Studio knows that this class belongs to the counter razor file. And then this thing should be a partial class and it derives from component base. And for that, we have to add a using directive. We can either use the quick fix menu here or we enter control and period on the keyboard. And then we have to add the using directive with Microsoft ASP.NET Core components. Now this class provides some functions you might want to use later, like, let's have a quick look, like here the on initialized or state has changed methods. We will use them later in this course. All right, and when this is done, we can actually move the code from the code block here to this file. Remove the code block. 
save everything and we're done. Now let's start the app again. There it is, here's the counter page. We can click the button and it still works. And now let's add a breakpoint in this method here. There we are and let's click the button again. And there is our breakpoint, it was hit, crazy. Now, what's up with the service? Let's have a look at the fetch data page. We continue here, go to fetch data. And this page actually makes a call to the web API of the server project. We can see that in the network tab of the console. So let's open the console with F12. And then we go to the network tab. And when we filter by XHR, which stands for XML HTTP requests, we refresh the page and here we can see the actual call. This is the call here, the URL, and then in the preview, we see the actual data. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And this is exactly the same thing we see here on the page. Now let's go back to Visual Studio and have a look at the code in the Solution Explorer now in the fetch data razor file we see lots of new stuff. We've got the page directive, we know that already, but then we're adding, uh, or we see a using directive uh, with the Blazor Battles shared project referenced. And after that, we inject the HTTP client class. So we are referencing the shared project because we're using the weather forecast class, down here actually. And then we inject the HTTP client, which enables us to make web service calls. Now, inside the table, we see a for each loop. This one uses the forecasts received from the service. We do all this later by ourselves, so please don't mind my pacing for now if it's a bit too fast. Now, in the code block, we see a new method called onInitialized async. Maybe you remember a few seconds ago, we had a look at the component base class and there you also saw this method. This thing is part of the component lifecycle and is called, as the name may imply, on initialization of the component. And in this method, we're using the injected HTTP client to make a get call to the weather forecast route, which would be the weather forecast controller of the server project, which is by the way, also using the same weather forecast class of this shared project. So when we have a look here, weather forecast, this is the get method I was talking about a few minutes ago. And this is also the exact same class the client uses. Now in this controller, let's add another breakpoint. As I said, we are here in the server project. So let's reload the page again and then have a look. Go back to Chrome, reload. As you can see, the debugger has been stopped. And now we are here in our get method of the server project. Fantastic. We can step through. We see that uh, there's a count of five for the returned value. So let's continue. And then we see Chrome again with the actual result. Now, although being able to debug client and server at the same time is great, I like to run the application in another way because with the way I just showed you, you have to stop and run the project by yourself every single time you made some changes to your code. This slows down development. As you can see, maybe I want to return seven values here. We would have to reload the whole application or restart it to see the result. You can see here the break breakpoint now would not be hit. So we have to stop our application first. Um, but there's another solution, of course, instead of using the play button, I like to use the package manager console with the .NET watch run command, which rebuilds the project when any code change has been recognized. So no matter if you change a Razor component or a controller class, for instance, as soon as you save the modified file, the app will be rebuilt and reloaded and you can directly see the result in the browser. I have to say, 
in theory. Sometimes it still doesn't work even with a .NET 5. You change a Razor component, for instance, and the application does not rebuild itself. But the solution mostly is to just save, for instance, a server file again, a CS file or something like that. You will see that in the, in the course. But in essence, you don't have to stop and restart the application by yourself every single time you make a change. But let's do this together now. I have the package manager console open here, but uh, we will find it also under view and then other windows and then package manager console. All right, now to start the app, we first have to go to the server directory. So if you have a look here, we are now in the root directory. So first we move to Blazor Battles, then server, and then we enter .NET watch run. And again, the watch command is there so that the app recognizes any modification in the code. And now when we go back, and reload the page here just to make sure and go to fetch data. We see that we've actually got seven results. Let's have a look at the counter. You see the breakpoint has not been hit now, but when I make a change in the code, in the code behind file now, let's increase the counter by two, for instance, instead of one, I save this. And you can already see that here it recognizes that this file has been changed. I can go back to Chrome, click me, and the counter is now increased by two. And the same for the server stuff. So I can go to the weather forecast controller, change that back to five, for instance, save it. Again, the app is rebuilding. You can also see that in Chrome actually, so maybe it's let's let's change that to six. And here's this cute little icon which says, hey, something has been changed. And let me reload the application. As you can see now, we've got six results. You see, this makes developing your Blazor WebAssembly app a lot faster. One thing we haven't talked about yet is the nav menu, but by now you may already know how this component works. Let's go back to Visual Studio and open the nav menu Razor. In here, you actually see some data binding and event handling with the toggle nav menu function, for instance, and also the variable nav menu CSS class. New though is the nav link component here. This is a built-in component for navigation links. The description already says it all, a component that renders an anchor tag automatically toggling its active class based on whether its href matches the current URI. And the href would be the string that is used with the add page directives of your pages. So here it's empty, but here you can see counter and fetch data, for instance. One last thing I want to show you in this example application is the first way of communication between components. When we switch to the index razor again, you see the use of the survey prompt component with a title. This title is actually a parameter. So the parent component index can tell the child component survey prompt anything with the help of parameters. And now looking at the survey prompt component, you see the title property in the code block marked by a parameter attribute. And then this title provided by the parent is used in the HTML above right here. All right, that should be it for the example application. Already a lot of input, I guess. Now we can stop the application with this little stop icon here in the package manager console. And now let's make a new Git repository out of all this and then start building our browser game with Blazor. There are several ways to create a Git repository. We can use the Git changes tab, for instance, here, or we use the menu Git and then say create Git repository. So let's use this one. And then we can choose to create a repository on GitHub so that our code is already stored on the cloud. We can use an existing remote repository or create a local only repo. 
This is totally up to you, of course. For me, I'd like to push my code to GitHub. So let's do that. You can see the local path here, development blazer battles. There's my account. I'm the owner. And then I can choose a repository name. Blazor Battles already exists because I created a repository with .NET Core 3.1. So we would have to change this maybe to Blazor Battles and then .NET 5. You can choose to make this repository private or public. I choose private for now, but when I finished all the recordings, of course, I will make this public. So you will have access to this repository and you can already see here the URL. And after all this configuration, we just click create and push. And now you can find this exact repository on GitHub. As you can see here in the Git changes tab, as soon as we make any change, for example, I add another character here, we can have a look and see the change. Let me save this. And then we also see the differences in the changes. So that's pretty neat. And every single time we want to commit something, we enter a message, say commit all or even push it directly. Or we can first just commit this. And then we will see here that there are changes that can be pushed to the repository. And if you want to undo the changes, we just right click and undo them like that. Now, if you have any trouble or just want to play around with the project, feel free to access this project on GitHub, clone the repository, fork it, star it, and so on. All right, I would say that's it for this section. Let's make a game now. You have already seen lots of code. Now it's time to write some by yourself. Welcome to Blazor Battles, where you will learn how to build your online browser game with Blazor WebAssembly, Web API and Entity Framework. In the beginning of making this game, we will focus on the client part. There might be some situations where a web service call would make sense, but we simulate that call by using local variables or methods first. Later, everything will come together when we add the web API and entity framework with a SQL server database. But let's talk about the actual game now. The very first thing we need in a browser game are resources. To make things easier for us and the players, there should only be one resource and this one and only resource shall be the banana. With bananas, a user is able to build units. The units that will be available are knights, archers and mages. They have different strengths and weaknesses and consume different amounts of bananas. With these units, a player creates an army and with that army, a player is able to fight battles against other players, hopefully win them and eventually get to the top of the leaderboard of blazer battles. By building this game, you will learn lots of stuff regarding Blazor WebAssembly, Web API and Entity Framework. We will start with a new Razor component, use data binding and event handling and then move on to communication between components. I think I've said enough, let's create that new Razor component next. Since bananas are pretty important to our game, let's create a component that shows the current count of bananas. Please note that everything we are going to build in the upcoming lectures assumes that we are working with an authorized player. Actual implementations regarding authentication will come later. Doing it that way is a lot more fun in my opinion. Anyways, the component we are going to build should be seen by the user all the time, so that he or she always knows how many bananas are available. So let's build a top menu for that. So in our client project and then in the shared folder, we right click and then add Razor component. And we call this one top menu. There it is. And in the code block, we can already add the bananas property and give it a default value. So in here we say public int bananas. And this is a property and we set this to a hundred for instance. And now to display this value, we use the data binding of Blazor by typing 
at and the name of the property or variable. So let's remove the header here and then simply say at and then bananas. Simple as that. And now we have to add this component so that we actually see it. So we can go to the main layout for that. And instead of the about link, let's use the top menu component. So we remove this and simply say top menu, close this, and that's it. Let's see how this looks. We go to the package manager console. I am already in the correct directory, meaning in the server directory, and I can simply type .NET watch run to start the application. All right, and far to the right, the top right, we see the number 100. Okay, now I'm not a designer, but still let's make this a little bit prettier. First, I'd like to add some icons. You can get them from the resources of this lecture or the GitHub repository. And we will only use the banana icon now, but later we make use of the others as well. And to be able to use these icons, we create a new folder in our www root folder and paste them there. So first add a new folder, we call this one icons and then let me paste the icons there. I've got them here, blazer battles icons, but again, just use them from the repository or the resources folder of this lecture and then just drag and drop them and that's it. Okay, and after that we can use the banana icon in the top menu component. So let's write a little HTML to display the icon. Let's go back to the top menu and here we say we first add a new div and then image and the image source is icons and then the banana icon, close this and in the end show the banana count and we have to remove this character here because otherwise this does not work. So I saved this and now let's have a look again. Sweet, we now see a banana. There's one little thing I'd like to add and that would be a little CSS or cascading style sheet. So let's add the class top menu to the div simply saying class and then top menu. And then we could change the app CSS down here or we make use of the so-called CSS isolation. The documentation of CSS isolation says it simplifies an app's CSS footprint by preventing dependencies on global styles and helps to avoid styling conflicts among components and libraries. To define component specific styles, create a razor CSS file matching the name of the razor file for the component in the same folder. The razor CSS file is a scoped CSS file. So let's do exactly that. This means, again, we do not need to change the app CSS. We can add another CSS file and we see an example of that already here in the main layout razor, there is a main layout razor CSS file. And when we go there, there's a lot of CSS just for the main layout and the same for the nav menu, for instance. And we do the same now by ourselves for the top menu. So we right click again, the shared folder, hit add and then new item. And this time this will be a CSS file so a style sheet and we call this, and that's important, it has to have the same name as the component. So top menu dot razor dot CSS. And now you can see that this file now is below the top menu razor file. And in here now we can add the class top menu. And what we can do is we center the content so we say justify content center. The display would be set to flex. 
and the last one, the width is 100%, something like that. And as you can see, the watcher does not recognize this change, but maybe it works when we, yeah, just save the top menu razor file. CSS does not work all the time, but still just hit Control S for the uh, razor component. And then we can have a look again. And here we see that the banana is now centered. Beautiful. One last thing to see the bananas also when the responsiveness of the app kicks in, we have to change the style sheet of the main layout component. Just to show you real quick with F12, I open the console and then I click this icon here, for instance, to see a view of uh, our application or web application on a smartphone or on a tablet, for instance, here the iPad iPhone, Pixel phone, and so on. And as you can see, we do not see the top menu. So what we can do to change that is go back to Visual Studio and have a look at the Razer CSS. And there is a class, yep, there it is, in line 34. We see that at this width, the display is set to none and we can simply comment this out or remove it. I leave that up to you. Save it again, maybe save the razor component again. And ah, you have seen it already. It recognized the change. And now even on the smartphone, we will see how many bananas we have. And now we can change the view back to the desktop view. Great. You've got your first component. And now let's commit this and then move on to the next lecture. When you're creating a Blazor application, you'll get to a point where you want components to communicate with each other rather quickly. The easiest way to communicate values from a parent component to a child component is via parameters. You have already seen this in the example code. Now we want the main layout, which is the parent component, to tell the top menu, which would be the child, how many bananas the current user has. And we do that with a parameter. So in the top menu component, it's already open. We add the parameter attribute to the property. And this is simply done that way. In brackets, we add parameter. By the way, that's why we're using a property here instead of a private variable. A private variable cannot be a parameter. That's one thing to keep in mind when you're designing your application. Now with that change, we are now able to set the bananas value in the main layout. So we go here and now there is the bananas parameter available. And we can say, for instance, now we want to see 200 bananas. When everything is saved and the application has been rebuilt, let's have a quick look. There we already see 200 bananas. Great, now let's see how communication works the other way around. Now communicating from child to parent in our case would mean that the component that has been added to the top menu would tell the top menu to change the value of the bananas, for instance. So let's create a new component in our shared folder, a new razor component, and we will call this add bananas, which will simply be a button that increases the value of the bananas. I know the player shouldn't be able to just add new resources whenever he or she wants to, but let's ignore that fact for now and try to continue learning. So we've got our new component and first let's add a simple button up here. We can remove the header and then say button and then we can use the bootstrap CSS classes as well as the open iconic icons to make this a little bit prettier. So let's say our button gets the class button and button info. And then we add a span for an icon. Again, we use the open iconic icons here. And I think a plus icon makes a lot of sense now. All right, and now let's add this new button here in the top menu simply add the add bananas component, save this, and then let's have a quick look in Chrome. 
There it is. We have a button. Great. Really quick, let's add a span tag to the top menu so that the banana value looks a little bit better. We can do it like that. Span move the closing tag here. And again, we lose a we use a bootstrap class which would be pop over header. Save this. We restart the application. Yeah, much better, I think. And now the next thing is we want that new button to change the value of the banana. So how would we do that? We cannot simply access the bananas property of the top menu. Instead, we have to raise an event. And when this event is fired, the top menu itself decides what to do. But let's build this thing one step after another. First, we go to the add bananas eraser component. And in here, we add a new property, which is an event callback. This thing is also a parameter. So we add the parameter attribute and then we say event callback with an integer because this is the amount of bananas that we want to add. And we call this event bananas edit like that. Now we have to invoke this event and to do that we add a new method and this method calls the function invoke async. So let's make this an asynchronous method. And this works like that public async task as return type. We call this increase banana count. And then we say await bananas edits, invoke async, and we add a value here. For now, this would simply be our default value. We want to add 10 bananas. And now we need something that calls this new method. What about our button? So in our button here, we use the on click event. We bind this event to our increase banana count method. So now when the button is clicked, this method will be called and this method will invoke this event here with the value 10. So we're almost done. Now in the top menu component, we also add a new method which will change the value of the bananas property. So in here, we add a new method, this time public void add bananas with an integer value. And here we simply say that our current bananas will be increased with plus equal the value. And then the last thing we have to do is in our add bananas component, we set the bananas edit parameter to the add bananas method. Let's recap real quick. The add bananas component gets an event callback property here, which is also a parameter. And when the button is clicked here with the on click event, this event callback is invoked with the help of our increase banana count method. And then the top menu component also needs a new function, which is called when the event is fired. And we set this up by using the parameter of the add bananas component. All right, let's see that in action now. There's our button, we click plus and we get more bananas. Great, this works just fine. Now, before we have a look at the third way of communication between components, let's create a new page first because that way we can change the banana count of the user, although we're not a parent or a child of the top menu component. In this game, we want to build an army of units like knights or mages. Now to build these units, you need bananas. The thing is, we don't want to build our units in the top menu. We want to build them with a separate page. So let's create this new build page first, which is another razor component in essence. So in our pages folder now, we right click, add razor component and then simply call this thing built. And right on top, we add the page directive 
with the route, which is simply forward slash and then build. Great. Now let's add a link to that page in the nav menu. So here is the nav menu razor. And in essence, we can copy this list item here. And then for the href, we say built. We can also change the icon, of course. For instance, let's use a wrench because we want to build something here and also change the text, of course, to build. Let's see if this already works. There's our page. It has been reloaded already and you can see the build nav menu entry. We click the link and here's our build page. Nice. Now let's clean up the menu while we're already at it. We don't need the counter and the fetch data links, for instance. So let's remove them and we can change the title as well, I would say. For instance, let's add a space here and in the index HTML, we can also change the title here. And the last thing I would like to do is in the index razor file, remove the survey prompt component, remove the text here and instead of hello world, let's say welcome to blazer battles. We save everything and then let's have a look again. Okay, go to home. We see the title has changed in our tab and also here in the menu and we see the text welcome to blazer battles. Okay, back to the build page. There it is. The plan is to have a drop down where we can choose a unit we want to build and a button that finally builds that unit. Let's focus on that button first. We can already add it and call a dummy method when the button is clicked. So first let's add a new method here, private void. And we call this method eat bananas because we will eat or consume bananas when we want to build a unit. And let's also lock this into the console. And we do this with console right line. And then we say so and so. So the amount of bananas have been eaten. And then regarding the button, we say again class button and this time maybe button primary and we call the text or we say we give this button the text eat bananas and then we want to call the method eat bananas so on click and then eat bananas by itself would not work this way we cannot give this method a value so what we have to do here is we have to use a lambda expression and then say eat bananas and then we can give this method a value so we got our method and also we got the on click event here with the button and we call the eat bananas method with the amount 10. All right, let's test that. Again, the only thing we expect here now is that we see this in the console. So back to Chrome, we open the console with F12, for instance, we go to the build page and there is our button, we click it and we see 10 bananas eaten. Let's make this a little bit bigger, maybe like that. And the bananas are eaten. This works fine, but the problem now is, as already mentioned, that we cannot change the value of the bananas in the top menu component. And the solution is a service. So let's create a service next. When we're creating a service, any component can inject this service and access its methods and properties. So the build page, for instance, could call a method of the service to decrease the amount of available bananas and the top menu component could access the current amount of bananas which is provided by that service. The crucial part is notifying the top menu component that the number of available bananas has been changed. 
To realize that, the top menu component has to subscribe to an event of the service. But let's implement the service first. For that, in our client project, we create a new folder. So add new folder and we call this services. And in this services folder now, we first add a new item and this shall be an interface and we call this interface i banana service let's make this public already and we can actually already add the bananas so we've got int bananas as a property and the method eat bananas so void eat bananas and a bunch or number of bananas, whatever you like. This is our interface and now we also create the implementation class. So add a new class, banana service, which is already public and we implement the I banana service. And now with control and period, we use the quick fix menu and say implement interface. We can remove the exception here as well as here for the setter like that. And the method eat bananas is actually pretty simple. We just say bananas minus equals a month. And let's also initialize our bananas here this time maybe with a thousand. Okay, that's nice, but we have to add an event of type action as well and also a method that invokes that event when bananas have been eaten. So let's do that. Back to the interface on top, we now add event action on change. And now here we also add this event, public event action on change that and then we can do one thing we could say on change invoke in the eat bananas method but I got a feeling that we need this more often so what we can also do is simply add another method here call it bananas changed and use the arrow operator to then call on change invoke and then in the eat bananas method we simply call bananas changed. So again, with bananas changed, the on change event will be invoked. And this is exactly what we want to do when we eat bananas. And to be able to inject this service now, we first have to register this service in the program CS and add the corresponding using directive. Again, we want to inject the service so we can access the bananas value and the each bananas method. So let's go to the program CS first. And here we say builder services add scoped and then we say for the i banana service we want to use the banana service implementation class and again with control period we add the using directive with the reference blazer battles client services and of course never forget the semicolon what we can also do is add this reference to the imports razor file here so that we don't have to use the whole namespace when we want to inject the service. So simply add using blazer battles client services. And now we can actually go to the build page, inject the service and call the eat bananas method. So here in our build razor component, up here now we say inject i banana service again if we wouldn't add the reference to the import razor we have, we would have to add blazer battles client services and so on so now we are able to just use i banana service and then say banana service we call it like that and here now 
instead of the console write line, we say banana service eat bananas with the given amount. All right, now the last step would be the top menu component, which now should display the bananas of the banana service. Again, we have to subscribe to the on change event of the banana service to do that. And we do this on initialization of the component and we also have to inject the banana service. So to the top menu razor file on top, we inject again the I banana service, call it banana service and then on initialization. So we use a life cycle method here, a component life cycle method, which means that this method is available for every Razor component. So protect it, override void on initialize, there it is already. And here now we say banana service on change, so for that event, we subscribe to that event with mentioning the event and then plus equals. And then we use this thing here, state has changed. And as you can see, it says state has changed, notifies the component that its state has changed. When applicable, this will cause the component to be re-rendered. And this is exactly what we want to do here, because this means that when the on change event is invoked, then we want this component to be re-rendered, because then it means that probably the bananas count has been changed and we want to get the value from the service and show the correct value from the service. Now to use the value from the service, of course, we have to change this thing here. Instead of just using the bananas of this component, we say banana service bananas, simple as that. Now this is great for initialization, but we also want to unsubscribe to the event when the component is destroyed. This means we have to implement the iDisposable interface and unsubscribe in the dispose method. So implements iDisposable and then there's this method public void dispose and in here now we can actually copy this and instead of plus equals, we say minus equals. And this is how we unsubscribe from that event. And maybe let's move the method down here. So this looks a bit better. And then we are done. I would say, let's have a look. Back to Chrome. We are already at the build page. Let's reload the app again. Let's click eat bananas and we can see that the value changes. But what about adding bananas? Well, this doesn't work anymore. And I would say we fix that in the next lecture. Apart from adding bananas, you might have already seen that the parameter in the top menu component is also obsolete. So let's clean this up. We can remove this parameter here. We can actually also remove this method here. And then we've got the bananas edit parameter. This is also not necessary anymore. And in the main layout, there it is. We can also remove the bananas parameter. And then in the add bananas razor, we can remove the event and also invoking the event, of course. Now, since the event doesn't exist anymore, we have to implement something else for the increase banana counts method. You might have already guessed it. We need a new method in the banana service and use this method here in the add bananas component. So in our I banana service interface, we add void add bananas again with an amount and then in our implementation class we 
implement the interface there it is and now we have to write something here and this is straightforward actually we can again copy some code and simply paste it here and instead of reducing the amount we just use plus equals to increase the number of bananas. Now to be able to use this new method in our add bananas razor component, again, we have to inject the iBanana service and then use the new service method in the increase banana count function. Please note that it doesn't have to be an asynchronous method anymore. So let's change the return type to avoid here first like that and then we inject our service with at inject i banana service banana service and down here we can now say banana service and then add bananas and let's use the 10 as a value again and this should be it let's test this in chrome we reload the application just to be sure and we can add some bananas, we can eat them, perfect. So now we can add and remove bananas from any place we want and we always see the current amount in the top menu. The next step is to actually build some units instead of just eating bananas with no result. For that, we need new models or classes, in other words. You have already seen the weather forecast class or model here of the example implementations. We can use these models in both the server and the client project to do anything we want to do with them. To build units, we first need a unit model. The idea is that with the unit model, we define the different kinds of units we want to make available in the game, like a knight or a mage, for instance. So let's create that model now in the shared project and give it some properties. We right click the shared project, add class, and we call this unit. Let's make this thing public and then we add some properties. The very first thing should be an ID. Then we give this thing a title. Next thing I would like to add is a value for its attack and also the opposite, the defense. And then every character should have an amount of hit points, of course, this is our health. And maybe we can already initialize that with a hundred. And the last thing is also an integer and this should be the banana costs. So we need a cost or a price to build that unit. So this is the definition of a unit. Now when a player or a user builds a new unit, there should be a representation of that particularly built unit for that user. So we need some kind of mapping model to store the complete list of units the user has built. Let's add a user unit model next. So we right click the shared project again, add another class, call this user unit, make this public again. And this model now gets an integer for the user ID. This might not make sense now, but it definitely will later when we add the database and so on. Then we add the unit ID. You've seen that a second ago, of course. And let's also add the hit points here. Because later when we let units fight against each other, these hit points will definitely change. Okay, great. These are all the models we need so far. Let's implement the unit service where the building magic happens next. We start with the unit service interface. So again, in our services folder of the client, we add 
a new item, an interface, and we call this iUnit service. We make this public. And this thing now will have a property that defines what kinds of units are available to build. Another property, which is the list of all the units the current user owns and a method to add units to that list. So again, first, a list of units. We call this units, get set. And of course we add a using directive here for blazer battles shared. Then the list the current user owns. So a list of user units. And we call this simply my units with the getter and the setter. And the last thing, the method add unit with the specific unit ID. Okay, now let's create the implementation class. Add class unit service. Implement the I unit service. And we can also say implement interface. And let's also remove these thingies here. We don't want to throw an exception. And this one here. All right, let's start with the units that will be available. Let's add a knight, an archer and a mage and all of them will have different values for their attack, defense and the banana cost. So for these units here, the available units, we initialize a new list and already add some units. Now the very first one shall be a knight with ID one. It's a knight, so we also set the title to knight. The knight has an attack value of 10. Defense is also 10. And the banana cost is 100, like that. Let's copy this and add two more. Of course, the IDs are then two and three. Then the title of the second one shall be Archer with an attack of 15, but the defense is only five. Banana cost 150 maybe. And the last one is the Mage with an attack of 20, but only one defense. Banana cost 200, like that. One little thing we have to change here is in the interface now, since we initialized them and we don't want to change them for now, we remove the setter for the units and then this arrow here is gone. All right, now the my units list can also be initialized with just a new empty list of user units like that. And last but not least, the add unit method, which will get the ID of a unit and then add a new user unit to the my units list. So first we say bar unit is from our units list. The first one where the unit ID equals the given unit ID and then our my units array or list gets a new unit, a new user unit with the unit ID from the actual units and we set the hit points to unit hit points like that. So we've got our available list of units, the knight, the archer and the mage. The user units is empty at first and then we've got this method add unit that takes a unit ID, so one, two, three, 
for instance, and then we look for the specific unit here and add this new unit to our my units list. Please note that this might not be the best design decision. We are not adding a new unit to the units collection. We are creating a new user unit and add it to a user unit list. So maybe we should use some kind of user unit or army service because these objects will be the army of the user in essence. However, to keep things simple, I'm fine with this conceptual flaw for now, but we will change that later when we implement the backend with Entity Framework, SQL Server, and so on. All right, now the last thing we have to do is register the service. So again, we go to the program CS, can actually copy the line here, and then say I unit service and the implementation class is the unit service. All right, now it's time for the last piece of the puzzle. We've got the models and the service, and now we can use both in the build component. So let's do that next. So in our build component, the very first thing, of course, is injecting the unit service. So we inject the I unit service and also call this unit service. Then we move to the code block. We can actually remove the eat bananas method first. Regarding the HTML part, I want to use a select box to choose the unit that should be built. The selected value of that dropdown will be the unit ID. We need a variable we can bind this unit ID to. So let's add a new variable and call it selected unit ID an integer selected unit ID and maybe give it one as default value first. And now let's add a new method and call it build unit. So public void build unit. Okay. Here we first grab the complete unit with all its values with the help of the unit ID. So we say var selected units is the unit service units and then first or default where the unit ID again equals the selected unit ID. And with that, we've got all the information of that unit and can use the banana cost to decrease the current banana amount of the user by calling the eat bananas method of the banana service. So banana service, eat bananas, and then selected unit banana cost. And then we add this new unit to the user units. So unit service, add unit and then selected unit ID. Great, so far the code block and now we add some HTML. Now the button calls the build unit method and we can change the text of the button as well. So first build unit and instead of only eating bananas, we actually built a unit now. And now to the select box. As mentioned, it will bind the selected unit ID and with a for each, we will display all available units. So first let's add a diff up here and we already give this thing a class like form group to make it a little bit prettier. And then we use a select, a typical HTML select element. Later, we will also make use of the input select, so the built-in component of Blazor WebAssembly, but first let's use this select here. We bind the selected unit ID, and we can also give this a class like form control. And then we make use of the for each here, we can hit type twice and then we can set the variables. So we want the current entry to call unit and the collection is the unit service units. And in here now 
we add an option, the value of the option is the current unit ID and we want to display the unit title and also maybe the banana cost with the bananas text here. All right, now to see a result so far, let's add a little output to the console in the add unit method of the unit service. So with control P, we can go to the unit service. And now here in our add unit method, we say console right line, and then something like unit title was built and also console right line and then your army size my units count like that maybe let's test that Here's our build page already with our select dropdown. We want to build a knight. Built, a knight was built. Our army size is one. Let me fix this here real quick. And the app is then rebuilding. Again, we build a knight. We built an archer and we built a mage. Built another one and another one and another one and our bananas are now below zero. So this works like a charm. Actually, we, we are able to build our army, but as you can see, there's still some work to do. We have to add an error message and block the building of units if there are not enough bananas available. And it would be nice to see your army on a separate page instead of the console. Let's create that page next. Let's create the new army component, which is also a page First, in our pages folder, we add a new razor component and we call this army. You can already add the page directive and add the army route. And since our units are stored in the unit service, we also inject the unit service with add inject i unit service unit service. And now we write a mix of HTML and C sharp again. We display all our units in a table and wouldn't it be nice to show a matching icon for every unit and also show the current hit points? Let's do that. First, let's add my army here and now the HTML. We use a table with the class table. And then we use a for each again. Our current item is the user unit in the collection unit service, my units. And then we add a table row and a column. And in that column now for the correct icon, we use a switch case where we have a look at the user unit, unit ID. And in here now we have three cases, of course. The first thing or the first image is the icons knight PNG. Close this and add the break here. And now let's copy this, paste it two more times. We have to remove this here, otherwise it doesn't work. And for the cases two and three, we've got the archer and also the mage. So with that, we should see the corresponding images. Then let's add another column for the actual title. So we say add unit service units and then the one 
where the unit ID equals the user unit unit ID. We do that to get the title of the unit. And the last column then to display the hit points. So user unit hit points HP. Maybe something like that. Now the code block can actually be left empty this time. And next we have to be able to open that page of course. So let's add a new nav link in the nav menu component. So right here we add another list item. Call this thing now or change the href to army. We can change the icon of course. Maybe use the people icon this time. And here we say my army. Great. Now the last step would be to remove the output in the console of the unit service. So let's just remove this here. And that should be it. Let's have a look. Go to Chrome. We currently see no army of course because the app has been rebuilt. But let's add a knight. Build this one. Go to army. And there is our knight. Let's add an archer. Also a mage. Then maybe a knight again. And this is our beautiful army. Now we've already seen that the amount of bananas doesn't really stop building new units. When the amount is below the cost of a unit we can still build it. We should definitely change that and tell the user that there are not enough bananas available. Additionally when we currently build a unit we don't get any feedback. Maybe some kind of pop-up notification, a message or a so-called toast would be nice. So let's add that next. The easy way to display an error message would be a little diff that is shown if a certain condition is hit. Let's try that first. In the build razor component, we add an if condition below the button. And if the condition is true, we show the little hint that we've got not enough bananas. We will add the variable in a second. First, the if. So add if and then Maybe we call this need more bananas. And again, if this is true, then we say diff class validation message. And then simply not enough bananas. And a sad smiley. Now we switch to the code block. We add the boolean variable bool need more bananas and we set this to false first and now down here we make the actual check so if banana service bananas is below the selected unit banana costs We say need more bananas is true and then we return and otherwise we reset the need more bananas flag to false. All right, let's test that already. We go back to our application, go to build, let's use the mage, we build it. Okay, one more time and now not enough bananas and we were able to build five mages. All right, if I want to build a knight now, it's not possible. Now we can add bananas again, of course. Test that again, works. Then we get the error message and when we have enough bananas again, the error message disappears. Sweet. So this already works like a charm, but I promised to add a toast message to the game. So let's do this next. There is this beautiful library by Chris Sainty called Blazard Toast. We can use it to display our toast messages. We simply manage the NuGet packages of the client project and search for Blazard Toast. But remember, First, we have to stop the application. So now we are able to right click the client project and then manage NuGet 
packages and here in the browse tab we can enter blazard toast hit return and there it is blazer toast by chris sainty and of course we want to install the package we say okay and that's it if any errors or warnings occur after installation it might help to rebuild the whole solution after that we have to make some configurations first in the program cs we register the new toast service and add the corresponding using directive so first here we say using blazard toast and here we can say builder services at blazard toast and then we have to go to the index html and in here we add another style sheet so here link href and this thing gets the href underscore content and then blazard toast and then blazard dash toast min for the minified CSS like that and we say rel equals style sheet then we add a necessary using directive to the imports razor file so there it is we add using blazard toast and also another one blazard toast services because we use the service to display the toast message and finally we have to add the toasts to the main layout so in the main layout here on the bottom that's important we add blazard toasts with the s in the end not only blazer toast it is blazer toasts and we close this we save everything and now we can use the toaster everywhere we want and it'll always be displayed on top we had an issue in the q a actually where we put the blazer toast component up here so on top of the diff and in this case the there was a problem with the z index in the css so the toast notification was not on top but if you put the component at the bottom here then it will be on top of everything else and i would say we start with the build component next to will show a toast notification so again build razor and in here now first we inject the toast service with add inject and then i toast service toast service like that and then we use it in case of too few bananas so in the code block we already have this if condition here and additionally to the flag we can now say toast service show error and we give this a text not enough bananas for instance and we can give this also a title and i think the set smiley fits here really well and that's already it we can test this now first we have to start the app again with dotnet watch run for instance and then here in chrome we go to the build page let's build a mage and now we get this beautiful toast notification that we've got not enough bananas so works like a charm we can also change the position of the toast and to be able to do that we add the reference blazard toast configuration to the main layout so let's go to the main layout first and up here now we say using 
blazard toast and then configuration and then for the components now you know how parameters work we can say position is toast position and then for instance bottom right we save this and then let's have a quick look again application has been rebuilt we built the knights and now we get the toast notification on the bottom right nice there are even more configuration options available feel free to have a look at the corresponding github repository which would be here github.com blazard toast and when you scroll a little bit down then you see configure toast component and then you can set the timeout the icon type and many many more things but for now i would say this works and in the next lecture we will also add a success message adding a success message looks a little bit different in the case of building a new unit now, why is that, you might ask? Well, the error message was created in a Razor component, but adding a new unit happens in a service, hence the success message should be created in that service as well. So we have to inject the toast service in the unit service. So here in the unit service, to be able to do that, we need a constructor first. So up here, we now say, CTOR, hit tab twice, so this is our constructor now. And here we say I toast service and call this thing toast service. We have to add a using directive for using Blazor to toast services. And then what we can also do is control period and then say create and assign field toast service with that we get this private read only toast service variable i would like to add an underscore here and also change it here so now we've got our toast service and can use it in the same way we used it we used it in the razor component so for instance in the add unit method now down here we can say toast service show success this time and regarding the text we can now say your unit and let's use the title so unit title has been built and for the toast notification title we say unit built and that's it Again, we can test this already. There's our app. We built the knight and we get our toast notification that a nice knight has been built. We can build an archer and also a mage, of course. And when we have a look at our army, there they are. Perfect. Now you know how to use any kind of toast messages anywhere you want. Congratulations! You learned a lot in this section. You have made your very first steps with Blazor WebAssembly. We started with an overview of the whole solution with its client, server and shared project. Directly after that, you created your first Razor component by yourself and learned all kinds of ways how components are able to communicate with each other and how to use data binding and event handling in Razor components. After that, we created new models to build units like knights, archers and mages. To do that, we also created new services and utilized a drop-down list and a for-each loop to choose the unit the user wants to build. Then we created a new page to display all the units of the user and also added toast notifications to give the user feedback of the building process. You are now able to display error and success messages to the user. Next up, we will cover forms and authentication in Blazor WebAssembly. Welcome to the forms and authentication section. In this section, you will learn all the parts that are necessary to register and authenticate a user. 
First, we will start with edit forms, built in forms components and validation. With that, we will create new models and use these models with these forms. After that, we will dive into the authentication. How does our web application know that a user has been authenticated and that this user is authorized to view a certain page, for instance? By answering this question, you will use the authentication state provider, the authorized view, the authorized route view, and so on. Additionally, we will utilize the local storage of the browser and in the end clean up the navigation so that our browser game looks different depending on the current state of the user. Let's start. We start with creating a simple login form. In this section, we will kind of simulate the authentication of a user because there will be no web service call. We will add one later when we implement the web API with Entity Framework, of course. But for now, let's build a login form and simply authenticate the user with any credentials. To add a form, we use the edit form component. An edit form needs a model to map its form components like input fields, for example, with the corresponding properties of that model. So let's create a simple user login model in the shared project first. So right click the shared project and we add a new class and we call this one user login. Let's make this public. And this thing only gets two properties. The first one is a string, which is the user name. And the second one also a string for the password. Now we can already make use of the built-in validation feature here. We just add the attribute required on top of every property and we'll see in a minute what effect this attribute has. So in brackets we say the username is required and we also say that the password is required of course. And to be able to use this we we add the reference system component model data annotations. Great. All right, now let's create a new page, the login page. So in the client project this time, right click pages, add razor component, and we call this one login. We can already add the page directive, page and the route login. And now here we can use the edit form component and to make use of this component, we have to add two arguments. The first one is the model. We will add the corresponding model in the code block in a second and also a function for the event on valid submit. There are also other events like on invalid submit for instance and on submit if you want to run a validation by yourself but let's keep things simple at the beginning so we can add a model variable and a submit function in the code block and use them in the form and let's also add a reference to the shared project to the imports razor real quick so that we don't have to use the complete namespace for the user login class. So here simply using blazer battles and then shared and then we go back and now in the code block let's add our user login variable so private user login user which is a new user login and now we can use this variable here, simply add user. And for the on valid submit, submit event, we add a private void handle login method like that. And then we can add this method here. And now we can use the built-in forms component input text to create our input fields for the username and the password. There are more forms component, of course, and we will use them in the registration lecture. But for now, we use the input text. And apart from just using these components, let's also try to make this form a bit prettier. So we will also use divs with certain classes and so on. So let's start with the div and the class form 
group. And now in this div, we add a label for the username. We give it the text username and then finally the input text component of a blazer. The ID here now is the username and we bind a value like that. This is again how to do a data binding with a blazer and the value here is the username of our user model. And we also give this a class, which is form control like that. And then we can actually copy this complete div for the password. It's also a form group class or we use the form group class. And now this label is for the password. We also give it the password label here. ID is password and the value we want to bind here of course is also the password of the user now and what we can also add is the type password so we do not see the text actually and the last thing we can add is a button of type submit give it also a class button and button primary and add the text login all right, and maybe the handle login method here can be used to display the username and the password in the console. So let's say console right line, and then we add the user username and also the user password. All right, I would say we test this already. Everything is saved. Make sure to start your application with .NET Watch Run maybe, and then go back to Chrome. We do not have a nav menu entry for the login, but the route is a login. So simply add login to the address bar. And there is our form. We open the console so that we see what we have entered. We can add a name like Patrick, for instance, and the top secret password here, hit login, and this is our results. Perfect. We see a form, we see the output in the console on submit, but what about the validation now? And what about actually authenticating the user? Now to use the validation, we have to add the data annotations validator component. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And right on top of the edit form, we add data annotations validator. There it is already. And we save this and then go back to Chrome. And when we now try to log in with an invalid form, the invalid control gets a red border. We can also display an explanatory text. To do that, we go back to Visual Studio and then add the validation summary component. So for example, below the button, we add validation summary, close it, save this. And now when we hit login, sweet, we get the text here that says the username field and the password field is required. Of course, we can also enter a custom error message. To do that, we go back to the user login model. So in here, additionally to the required attribute, we can say error message and then something like, please enter a user name. Save this again. And now we see our custom error message. But what about actually logging the user in? Well, actually you would use the authentication state provider for that, but we're not ready for that yet. Let's simply use a variable that stores an authenticated state and change the content on the login page accordingly. So back to our login razor component, we add a variable bool is authenticated, which is false in the beginning. And when we click the login button, we simply say is authenticated is true. And now let's simply add an if condition. And if the user is authenticated, 
we display something else instead of the login form. So if it's authenticated and here in the else case, we put our login form and here we simply say in a header, welcome and then user username like that. All right, so now let's add a username again and a password. We click login and we see welcome Patrick. Well, you see this kind of works, but it doesn't really feel right. We are still on the login page and the whole time the top menu did not change. So there's definitely a better way to handle this. But before we get to that, let's have a deeper look at the built-in forms components with the registration page next. The edit form of Blazor WebAssembly provides the following built-in form components you can see here on that page. So we got the input text we have already used, but we've also got the input checkbox, input date, input file, and so on. Lots of stuff and we will utilize most of them for the user registration. But before we can do that, we need a model again. And with that new model, we will also use more validation features. So let's go back to Visual Studio and let's create a user register model here in the shared project. We hit add class and then user register make this public again and with that model again we will use new validation attributes i will explain them along the way the final user model will be created later when we use the web api and entity framework so let's start with the properties only and then I will add the validation attributes. First, what we can do is use an email for the registration, of course. After that, again, I would like to use a username. Then we will use a bio. That's because we can use the text area then. And then we will use a password again. And after that, I want the user to confirm the password simply because with that, I can show you a way to compare the password and the confirm password string. And if the passwords do not match, we can display an error message. After that, what I want to do is I want to enable the user to choose a unit at the beginning or upon registration. So we will add a start unit ID and for that we will use the input select and we can already initialize that with the value one. Then for the input number component, we simply add some bananas. And yeah, upon registration, the user can decide how many bananas he or she wants. Then for the date component, we can choose something like the date of birth. And we initialize that with date time now maybe. And then for now, the last one is the checkbox. So a bool for is confirmed and we will use a validation to say that the user is confirmed. We could also choose something like uh, I accept the terms and agreements and so on. You get the idea. So these are our properties, the email for the input text, the username for the input text, then the bio for the input text area a password and confirm password also for the input text, but I will show you a validation feature here. Then we will use the input select for the start unit ID, the input number for the bananas, the input date for date of birth, and then the input checkbox for is confirmed. All right, these are the properties and now validation. Again, we can choose required here and again add the reference system component model data annotations. And also for email, we can validate the correct form of the email address. That's it for the email. The username, 
we can say we want to have a specific length for the string or a maximum value for the string. And this then would be the string length. And we can say I want a maximum length of 16 and also give this a custom error message like your username is too long 16 characters max something like that and of course close this all right now the bio does not really need validation but the password would be interesting first we say the password is required and also let's give this a string length also with a minimum length this time so let's say the maximum length is 100 and then we say the minimum length you can set it like that is six so you have to enter a password with at least six characters and then confirm password as i said we can compare this with the password property this is the other property as you can see and also add an error message like the passwords do not match okay then regarding the bananas start unit doesn't need validation but the bananas for instance we can say we want a specific range so the user can set bananas and let's say they can choose the difficulty for the beginning of the game by themselves so we can start with zero and a maximum value of a thousand and again add an error message that says please choose a number between zero and a thousand like that and then i think the last thing we can add here is a validation for is confirmed because we only want to accept users that are confirmed in essence so for that we have to use the range attribute again but say type of now is bool and the range we want to accept we have a minimum and the maximum value feels kind of strange but we have to add true for both so this means this is only valid when the checkbox is active and for that again an error message only confirmed users can play like that of course in a real case scenario you would send an email so that the user has to confirm the registration but instead of is confirmed you could again also use the checkbooks for uh, i accept all the terms and whatever again i think you get the idea but this is i think enough for the user register model we've got lots of properties and also validation and in the next lecture we build the form for that all right so let's create a new page here we add a new razor component and we call this register and this is our register page so let's add the page directive and the route is simply register and we can start with the code block actually i would like to add a user register model for our edit form so new user register and also a method void handle registration and here now we just say console write line and then we want to store this new user in the database but we will do that later of course okay great now the edit form with all the user register model properties this time instead of the validation summary we will use the validation message below the corresponding form control maybe it's more convenient for the user maybe it's not i leave this up to you all right we have by the way 
to also inject the unit service because we will give the user the option to choose a starting unit. So for that, we need all the available units. So we inject the unit service like that and then the form. So first the edit form component. We have a model, of course, this is our user. And then on a valid submit, we call handle registration. And now similar to the login form, we start with a diff, give this thing a class form group. And in the diff, we add a label, this time for the email, give this thing the name email, and then the first one is the input text again with ID email. We bind the value user email. The class is the form control. And that's it for the input text. But now, as I said, I want to use the validation message attribute here or component, sorry. And to use this, we have to give this or to set the parameter for and here we have to enter a function actually with a Lambda expression that says this is the validation message for the user email like that. So this is the very first one. Now we can actually copy this for all the others. So we've got the email, we've got the username, we've got the password, we've got the confirm password, the bio, the start unit ID, the bananas, date of birth, and is confirmed. And now of course we have to make some changes. So the username is pretty easy, I guess. Simply change email, or replace email with username. Then here also username. So this should be it for the username and then the password, which is a bit different. Text is simply password as well as the ID, but now the label is the password. We want to bind to the password and also the validation message. And again, give this a different type so that we don't see the text. And now for the confirm password, it's in essence the same. We say confirm password, add it here, change the text here as well, confirm password, same here, and here and also add the corresponding type. Okay, so we got the email, username, password and confirm password. Now for the bio, this is not an input text. This time this is an input text area. So like that, you see it changed automatically and we bind this to the bio and also change this here, of course. This is the bio here and here and of course here for the validation message. Although we can actually leave that because we do not have a validation attribute added to the bio, so just remove it. The same actually for the next one, the start unit ID, but this looks a bit different anyways. We've got the text area now for the input select. First, the label is for the start unit. And we also say the text here is a start unit, but now this is an input select. And here we remove the validation message. ID again, start unit. 
we bind this to the start unit ID. And now inside that component, we add a for each. And this is again why we need the unit service. We say for every unit in the unit service units, we add an option with the value unit ID and we display the unit title like that. And after that, we can move on to the bananas, which is an input number component. So first, this is for the bananas like that. And then here we say bananas as well as here and also here. But this now is an input number component. That's it for the bananas. And now we've got only two left. I hope you're still with me. First, the date. So we've got a label for the date. Uh, let's, let's call it what it is, date of birth here and here. We can remove the validation, call it date of birth and the same here. And again, this is an input date now. Okay, this should be it for the input date. And now finally, the last one is the input checkbox. This looks a bit different. We have the validation message first for is confirmed. The label, let's call it confirmed here and there. We give it the text confirmed, but to make this look a bit better, we say this gets the class form check label and also the diff now gets form check here change the property and then also change this class here not form control it's form check input and finally say input check box and remove this on top. I hope that's it. And the very last thing is add a button, of course, with the type submit and the class button button primary and call this register. All right, take a deep breath. This was a lot. So let's save this and then have a look. So back to Chrome, we manually enter the URL register. Now we've got our form. That's already nice. And now let's have a look and test all the validations. So first hit the register button and nothing is happening. The button works. We see something here in the console, but of course we have to add the data annotations validator. So on top, let's say data annotations validator, save this and then have a look again. We hit register and now we see, okay, the email field is required and the password field is required. Okay, this works fine already. Now, what about the username? Let's say this is my big username hit enter and we see your username is too long, 16 characters max. Now this works. What about the bananas? We have 100, but let's say we want 10,000 bananas. We register, it says, please choose a number between zero and a thousand. We can uncheck the form and we already see only confirmed users can play. And then what about the password? We say one, two, three, for instance, it already says the field password must be a string with a minimum length of six and a maximum length of a hundred. That's nice. So let's add six characters, register. Then it says the passwords do not match. So I think this already works. So let's try to register a user now 
with an email address, mail at patrickgard.com. This is my username, my top secret password. This is a wonderful bio. Let's fix this. I want to start unit. Yeah, let's say night. Night is great. A wonderful bio. I want a thousand bananas. Date of birth. Yeah, that's okay. And then we say uh, this is confirmed. We register and we see store this new user in the database. Great. This works just fine. Now there are some things we can change. Of course, before we move on, the very first thing I want to show you is how to add an asterisk for the fields that are actually required. And we can we can do that real quick with CSS. So let's do that in the next lecture. All right, so we see in the user register model that the email is required. The username isn't, but the password is required as well. And I want to see a specific character for that. Now to make this possible, we add some CSS and we can also use CSS isolation for that. So this means we've got our pages folder here and the register uh, razor component. Now again, we can use CSS isolation. So just enable that for this component, this CSS, the style sheet in essence, or we can add it to the app CSS. That's totally up to you. But let's add a CSS file here. We say in the pages folder, add and then new item. This is a style sheet and this has to be called register razor CSS. You can see it's now under the register razor component and I want to use a class called required and now with colon colon and then after we can add our character to say that this is required. This is the one. We can also say the font should be bold and also set the color to red. And then back here, we say for the label class required and the same for the password. We save this and then have a quick look in Chrome. App has been rebuilt already and you can already see now we've got this asterisk for the email and the password because these two are required. Great. Now there's another thing I want to show you and this is how to lock objects to the console. In our case, the complete user object because saying let's store the user in the database is not really enough for me. I want to lock the complete object and this does not work with console right line. We have to do something else for that. So let's do that next. So although the promise is that with Blazor WebAssembly, we do not need JavaScript anymore. This statement is not really true. As you can see here, console right line says only store this new user in the database, but we've got a model. We've got the actual user and what happens now? If I want to see this user, I can save this and then have a quick look in Chrome. Again, I enter an email address test at example.com for instance, a password, and then I say register and then I get something like that. Okay, I see that my model is of type user register, but I actually want to see all the properties, of course. Now in JavaScript, this would work with console log, for instance, and then the user, but we do not have do not have a user here in this context. So what can we do now? The easiest way is to actually inject the JavaScript runtime. To do that, we say add inject and then I JS runtime call this JS runtime. And with that now we can use any JavaScript method we want. So for instance, we can say JS runtime and then invoke async or invoke void async. And then we say 
console log. This is the actual method we want to call. And then user, like that. So let's save this. As you can see here, this method invokes the specified JavaScript function asynchronously. Now we do not actually need to call this asynchronously, but there is no other method available. So let's just keep it like that. We save this and then have a quick look again in Chrome. Here we are again, add an email test at example.com for instance, the username, a password, this is the bio, we've got the start unit, the bananas, the date, we hit register. And now, as you can see, this is the thing we actually want. We want to see the complete object. And this goes a lot further, of course, we could add another parameter here, because as you can see, it's an array of objects we can add or an array of arguments. Let's say this is the great new user, save this and have a quick look again, we add an email, beautiful username, password, hit register and now we see the text and then the object. Great. Again, this works with any kind of JavaScript method here, we could lock the time with console time and so on. So feel free to play around with that. I love this because that way I can actually lock the complete object in the console. And this really, really makes development a lot faster in some situations. As a little bonus, I want to show you how you can use radio buttons instead of the input select here. Because with .NET 5, Microsoft introduced a input radio button or radio group component to Blazor WebAssembly. Again, when we have a quick look here, this is the registration page. And here we have an input select to choose the start unit. Now, instead of this input select, we can choose radio buttons. To do that, we go back to Visual Studio and this is done actually real quick. The very first thing is instead of input select, we choose the component input radio group first, because this is a group of radio buttons. And then here, instead of the options in the for each, we use the input radio component of blazer, we have to set the value parameter. So with a capital V. And then we can actually close this right here, and give it the text after the input radio tag. And actually, that's already it. Let's also add a break here. And maybe also here because this looks a little bit different. And now let's have a quick look at Chrome again, there you can already see the change. But I think, well, there's some CSS work we can do here. The very first thing I would add is a space between the actual radio button and the text. So back to Visual Studio, just entering some spaces does not work. So what we can do is add a span, for instance, put the title into the span and add a style. I know inline styles, not the best practice way. But just for that quick example, we can say padding left five pixels, for instance, save this again. And now you can see this looks a bit better. Now we can add an email address, username, password, and then let's say we want the mage register. And here now we can see we get the start unit ID three. So already works like a charm. I leave this up to you if you want to use the select box or the input select or the input radio with radio buttons. And now I would say we finish up the registration process. There may be times in a web application where you want to navigate a user to a certain page. For instance, after the registration process, you may want to navigate the user to the login page so he or she can start with the game. With Blazor, you can use the navigation manager 
for that. So here in our register component, we first inject the navigation manager. Add inject and then simply navigation manager and we call it navigation manager. And then in the handle registration method, we can use the navigation manager with the method navigate to. So navigation manager and then navigate to. And here we can simply add the login route like that and save this. And that's already it. Let's test that real quick. Again, we enter an email address a password and hit register. And as you can see, this already works great. And now I would say it is finally time for authentication. Now, if you made it this far, you are definitely ready for the complete Blazor WebAssembly full stack bootcamp. You have what it takes to build a full stack web application with Blazor WebAssembly, Web API and Entity Framework completely by yourself from start to finish. In the next lectures of this course, you will add authentication to the client with the help of the authentication state provider and the authorized view. Then in the following sections, we will dive deep with a Web API, Entity Framework and SQL Server. So you will build the web service that will be called by the Blazor WebAssembly client and you learn how to store the data in a database. Additionally, we will implement token authentication with JSON web tokens and after that we will enable users to store their units on the server, fight battles against other users, climb the leaderboard to become the best warrior and watch the history of their battles. You see, there is still a lot to learn with Blazor WebAssembly. As a thank you and reward for completing this part of the course, I want to give you a pretty sweet discount. Make sure to use the link in the video description below. I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the complete course.